Facebook gave an exception to allow child nudity. So there was a, 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 a Brazilian children's band and, and the children on the cover were fully nude toddlers. And Facebook said, because of artistic and public interest value, we're going to make a news with the exception to allow this child nudity. So, I mean, I, I just think the hypocrisy of Facebook just being able to, and the, the fact that they can change their rules anytime they want or make exceptions to their own rules. I think that's where we get into this dangerous territory. Hi everyone, before we start, I want to take a minute to talk about my next book. You may have heard about the story of GameStop in January or February and thought it was all over. You're sadly mistaken. Unfolding Online has been a clash between the corrupt practices of Wall Street and the hive mind of the internet. It's a hot, raging information war pitting retail investors against financial giants swimming in corruption and fraud. The trailer is at the end of this podcast, but if you want to help crowdfund the book or just find out more, you can sign up to my mailing list to get access to a preview of chapter one or go to whenmoon.com to read more about the book. The first 200 people to pre-order the book will get a free pack of To The Moon crayons with their book. I just want to make a quick mention of our sponsors. Namecheap are one of the cheapest places on the internet to get a domain name for your next website. I've used Namecheap for all the sites I've ever purchased and I've found it really easy to use. Spreaker are a rapidly growing platform for podcast recording, publishing, and monetization with pricing plans as low as $7 per month. A cheap way to host your podcast and start earning from your back catalog of shows. Finally, ExpressVPN is the internet's most trusted VPN. Protect your privacy and watch and view content that is location locked you could even try watching Netflix from a different country. And right now, they're offering 35% off 12 months of ExpressVPN. Please use the links in the description below if you want to support the show. Anyway, here's the podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of Chatter. Today, I am here with Ryan Hartwig. I think this is your fourth time on the show. Actually, I think you now hold the record. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you are former Facebook whistleblower, activist, and author of the brand new book, Behind the Mask of Facebook, a whistleblower shocking story of big tech bias and censorship. So yeah, man, welcome back to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Josh. It's so, ni so nice to meet, see you again. Yeah, I mean, we're in the midst of some pretty wild times right now, but um, yeah, uh, it's a crazy time to be alive. So yeah, why, why did you decide to write your book? Um, for people that, that don't know and, and maybe give yourself uh, like a little background in yourself for those who haven't heard your um, other episodes with me. Yeah. So uh, I went public last year uh, with Project Veritas. So uh, I worked at Facebook for two years as a content moderator. So I was reviewing all this, all the bad stuff, the, the evil stuff on the internet, the pornography, the cartel videos, terrorism. So I would delete that stuff, but I would also monitor trends in politics. And so I noticed this bias creeping in <clears throat> from Facebook where anything Trump was, you know, bad, orange man, bad, and they pushed leftist ideology. So that's why I went public last year. So I, I filmed with a hidden camera at work for about nine months. And so since, you know, I, when I filmed, I had tons of content that I filmed, tons of examples. They, they all can be in the video with Project Veritas. So I decided the public deserved, deserved to know the truth, all, all the details. So I wrote this book, um, Behind the Mask of Facebook. It's this book right here. And uh, it just goes into excruciating detail, you know, with concrete examples of how Facebook ignored their own rules on hate speech in order to favor the left, in order to protect leftist journalists and, you know, interfere in elections and on, a, on a global scale, even in the UK, in Canada and in South America. So that's that's why I wrote the book. I just, you know, the public, the, the, the global public needs to know. I was going to say global citizens, but that sounded kind of like 1984. <laughs> but but the peop yeah, people need to know around the world what's going on at Facebook behind closed doors. Yeah, I mean, the Mark Zuckerberg isn't exactly the uh, the benevolent overlord that I hope for. Um, <laughs> but most people, most people, and I think we we sort of mentioned this the first time we spoke. But a lot of people would consider what you've just said to be wrong. Right. They would say, no, Facebook is always pushing like right wing news sources. Um, people yeah. often highlight um, how popular and how 
high up the rankings and like search things that um, people like Ben Shapiro come in. Uh, I, I see he's often someone cited. So uh, why why are they incorrect in your mind? Yeah. So, you know, there, you know, people like Ben Shapiro do exist on, on Facebook and they're popular. So, um, you know, I just, I just think, you know, I have more than 30 examples. So, and there's even politicians here in the United States who claim that there is, there is no bias against right wingers on Facebook. Um, I mean, the, uh, just a, one example stands out to me. And then there was a far right Senator in Australia named Fraser Anning who got attacked by a kid. He had an egg cracked on the back of his head. And then the senator turned around and slapped the kid in the face a couple of times. And that violated Facebook's child abuse policy. And But Facebook made the newsworthy exception to allow child abuse because the whole video showed the senator being humiliated. Um, and then we have, have examples of where Facebook, you know, deleted viral videos of Trump supporters being attacked. That would have sh- sh- uh, created sympathy. So, I mean, yeah, if you look at maybe there's one or two examples where, you know, people will say, well, they didn't, they didn't shut down the New Zealand massacre quite, quite well enough. Well, I was there when the New Zealand massacre happened, the Christchurch, and we were trying to shut it down every way we could. So to say that Facebook allowed that because they, they support white nationalism, that, that's a myth. Um, I mean, they have policies against white nationalism, but they also have policies against, you know, attacking straight white males. But then they allowed they allowed attacks against straight white males on purpose, and they let Don Lemon say white males are terror threats in violation of the hate speech policy. So time and time again, I mean, when you, maybe there's a couple examples on or one or two where you're like, okay, well, they're allowing both sides, and but I have a, you know more than thirty examples of them purposely, you know, favoring the left and censoring conservatives. Mm. Now, most people would say when, or well, at least the left would would say when when you bring up points like like white males are a, you say Don Lemon saying white males are a terror threat. Like a lot of people yeah. would then would then come at, back at you like, oh, but that's just one example. Um, you know, the uh, black people or whatever minority are disparaged uh, daily on Facebook and, and you know, n- you don't care about them. Why do you care about this guy? Yeah, that's a good point. So, um, you know, I think we should be treated equally. I think that, you know, any form of racism is racism. And I just give those examples because it just shows Facebook breaking the rules. But even, I think there's something we can all agree on, even with the left. And that's when, you know, Facebook gave an exception to allow child nudity. So there was a, 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 a Brazilian children's ban and, and the children on the cover were fully nude toddlers. And Facebook said, because of artistic and public interest value, we're going to make a newsworthy the exception to allow this child nudity. So, I mean, I, I just think the hypocrisy of Facebook just being able to and the, the fact that they can change their rules anytime they want or make exceptions to their own rules. I think that's where we get into this dangerous territory. Where, where in any universe is it acceptable for Facebook to make an exception about child nudity, right? For some uh, children's band in Brazil. So it's examples like those that really wake you up to the fact that regardless of where you stand, left or right, ideologically, Facebook has way too much power. And, you know, other people have talked about this and, you know, there's the Social Dilemma movie on Netflix. <clears throat> but by other people, most people would say that well, okay, they have too much power, so let's, or maybe they'd say, no, they need to give them more power because they're not doing enough against what, you know, racism or whatever. But uh, they just have too much power to begin with. So maybe maybe you agree with that. Um, but yeah, in, in the book, Beyond the Mask of Facebook, I just I go into more details about those exceptions. And uh, I think it's a very good read where, wherever you stand ideologically. But that, that's the other question is, what do we do about Facebook? Because if they have too much power, what do we do? Okay, so do we sue them? which we can't really um, because they have civil liability protections. Do we do antitrust lawsuits? Hang on. What do you mean civil liabilities protections? What's that? Yeah. So uh, they are protected under Section 230, which is the Communications Decency Act of 1996. So that was a law that was created to protect online forums. So online forums in the past, you know, in the 90s and in the early stages of the Internet, if I made, if I created a website, you know, ryansforum.net, and then I any comment that anybody put on there, I was responsible for, so I could be sued for that, mm-hmm. <clears throat> for defamation or libel. So if, uh, Congress changed the rules just to allow the flourishing of the internet. So they gave civil liability protections. So I, I, so if I try to sue, you know, Facebook for certain things on there that I don't agree with, then they can't really be sued civilly. So 
that's Section 230. So they, they have these protections, which, they, which they've been using. But that law got misinterpreted by the Ninth Circuit Court in California here. And so they have additional protections. They're supposed to act in, in good faith and as a good Samaritan and remove, restrict content that's, you know, lewd or lascivious. So they can do that. But as far as they shouldn't be allowed to promote content over other content, but they do because they have a news feed and they, they choose uh, which stories to promote. So that, that's where they've kind of, kind of gone astray. So we, here we are in 2021. We have a couple of options. Trump just filed a lawsuit against Twitter and Facebook. So his argument is, hey, these, these companies are acting as at the behest of the government censoring people. So they are, in essence, state actors or it's a government agency. <clears throat> so his argument is, like, is, is the difference between giving permission to, to, a, to an agency, to a company, versus directing them. So his argument is Facebook or the government is directing Facebook to do certain things. Um, so it's kind of like, I don't know if you have, what's your, you have a McDonald's, you have McDonald's in London, right? So imagine a McDonald's. So if there's someone that, who's being unruly in the McDonald's, who do you call? You call the authorities, right? right. So you call the police, they show up and they, those, they kick them out. You can't just trespass them yourself. You have to call the authorities. So right now, Facebook is acting as both the McDonald's and, and the authorities and the police. So that, that's a good analogy because they're, you know, they're basically a judge, jury, and executioner as far as their policies go. Um, they can create their policies. They can make exceptions to their policies. And what, what a lot of people don't realize is if indeed Facebook is acting as like a quasi-government agency, um, then th those penalties, those community standards are under penalty of law. It's essentially penal code. And so, um, <clears throat> so that's the Trump's lawsuit. Now, another fascinating legal strategy that I'm working with uh, someone on, Jason Fick is an individual who, sued, who had, had a lawsuit against Facebook. He went to the Supreme Court in January. Supreme Court chose not to hear it, of course, because they're, they're, uh, they're pussies. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but this, this legal argument has to do with the Fifth Amendment. So we, instead of suing Twitter and Facebook, we can just sue the United States government directly under the Fifth Amendment for due process. So the Fifth Amendment says you can't deprive someone of you know, liber life, liberty, or property. In this case, it'd be liberty and property we're being deprived of, and there's no legal recourse. But if, if, they are, if they're acting as a state actor and they're working as a government agency, then we should be able to sue them because and what they're doing is not uniformly applied. There's no measurable bounds. So that's, that's another legal strategy, suing the United States government under the, under the Fifth Amendment. Once again, Jason Fick, is, has formed an organization called the Social Media Freedom Foundation. I'm working with him. So we're hoping to get this off the ground. Um, but that, that's an, in a nutshell is Section 230. People, people always say, oh, publisher versus platform. I choose them not to put it in those terms. It's a little bit, um, it's not super accurate as far as <clears throat> the law. Because those, those terms, publisher and platform, are not even in the, the wording of the law at all. It's like internet service provider versus something else. Um, but yeah, so in a nutshell, Section 230 gives these companies protections. The, the law has been mis misinterpreted to give them additional protections where they don't have to be good Samaritans, but they're using that, that law to basically make themselves the overlords of the internet. Mm. Now, this is, the, is this the same basis that Steven Crowder is currently suing YouTube under? Is the fair application of their um, policies or is it a little different? Possibly. I'm not super familiar with that lawsuit. Okay. No, just because I'm aware that he's suing them on on similar ish grounds to uh to this because he was um basically saying how can you remove my content? But like things like n nude yoga are fine. Like if anyone doesn't believe me, by the way, go just like search on YouTube nude yoga and then come back and tell me that they're doing it for the protection of you or your children, right? Because <laughs> those things are not age locked either. Or there's like yeah. there's videos that he's brought up that are not age locked that are um it's like a two two dudes who are like trying who are like oh, they're like talking about dildos or something like this. And mm. It's just like like their content policies are fair enough, but you have to apply them fairly. Because if they were fairly applied, then we probably wouldn't be in the same position that we're in. But they yeah. the problem is that they arbitrarily decide how to apply their policies. Now, all of these big tech platforms have been guilty of this. It's Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, um, all of them. 
And ultimately, um, it seems like what we need is uh, the United States government and particularly the White House to stand up and tell Facebook exactly what is misinformation. <laughs> yeah, no, we saw that this week, man. Like, oh my gosh, I, I bet Trump's attorneys were so happy when they saw Jen Psaki, the, tr- the White House spokeswoman. Was the lawsuit filed yeah. before or after that? before yeah like oh no way so that just like that wasn't like reactionary to that they weren't they hadn't the lawsuit wasn't filed in reaction to that it was already there yeah it was already there and i, I i'm wondering if so I, I have two theories either either they were super brazen about it and and why it just doesn't care and they're like okay or they or it was a mistake because it gave the trump a lot of ammunition so for those that don't know so jim pasaki i believe on wednesday or thursday in a press conference re- with reporters she basically said, you know, we're flat, we're flagging misinformation about COVID and we're, we're feeding it. We're basically, um, what's their flagging it for Facebook. So they're, they're like passing on to Facebook, Hey, this is COVID misinformation. And so like, that's, that's the definition of like instructing, you know, giving direction. Like, it's like, Hey, Josh, I give you permission to turn around and smash a hole in that wall. Okay. You have permission to do that versus Josh, turn around and smash a hole in that wall. So yeah, Facebook really, um, Jim Psaki really messed up um, in that press conference. But it really just, I mean, I know, I'm sure it was happening behind the scenes, uh, but it just really, saying that publicly kind of leaves, removes all doubt. <clears throat> inviting, uh, inviting versus instructing. Okay. No, it's inciting. They're inciting. Oh, inciting, them. inciting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, like yeah, if, violence if, and incitement. If, if, if speech is violence, is stopping speech also violence and therefore they're inciting? But no. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if you can quite make that jump. But um, <laughs> how do you think we, yeah, how do you think we got to this moment that, that it was like, uh, because I remember it's gone in three years from. Alex Jones is the only person who will ever be removed from the internet because he is uniquely dangerous to Joe Biden's administration saying, we're going to tell Facebook who to remove. Yeah. How do you think the acceleration of that just has been so rapid and sort of so unchallenged in a way? Like, obviously there's, there's, there's people like yourself who are trying to challenge this. Mm -hmm. And, um, but if you asked, if you watch CNN, this this problem doesn't exist, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, like, yeah. how do you think we've got, like, do you think that's the reason that everything has gone so quickly and without opposition? <clears throat> yeah, the, the the fact that we have the media, which we sometimes we call the fourth estate. Um, excuse me. The fact that we have the media, like, pushing this narrative as well is part of the problem. So when I was at Facebook, I saw that a lot of their policies um, mirrored kind of the media narrative. So about, you know, just being woke and LGBT pride month. So they would allow, you know, female nipples ex- exposed during pride marches, of course, in a violation of their nudity policy. But, but yeah, I saw time and time again, they would just kind of like, they would just kind of follow the media narrative. So it's easy to Facebook for Facebook to say, oh, we're just, you know, we're just going with what the news says. Like when it was, there's so much, you know, false information and misinformation that's put out by the, the mainstream media where they ignore, you know, COVID or they ignore, uh, you know, vaccine issues or they don't allow discussion of those those ideas. So, yeah, I, th- I think that's what's made it so easy for Facebook is you have this this media that's just working. They're just working in lockstep with each other, promoting this, this narrative, this agenda. I think people are waking up, but it's still really ironic. And we were talking about this before the show, like how all these people on the left who, you know, four or five years ago were protesting Monsanto and, and we're all about, you know, freedom of choice for their health care, you know, my body, my choice. And now, now we see them trying to, you know, pushing the vaccines. Like, oh, you've got to take the vaccine. Um, it's kind of like, it's funny because it's, it's raining in Arizona right now, which is rare. But, you know, if I'm out there wearing, holding my umbrella, it's kind of like saying, well, if I don't, if you don't have your umbrella, my umbrella doesn't work as far as like the vaccine. So like, like, or even just discussing like Evermectin or, and we probably don't, we don't want to get too into the details on that, but let's not mention yeah. that. Cause the last yeah. time that we talked about this, the video got removed and I still have the strike on my channel because of it. Okay. Um, so, so, so needless so, to say, I mean, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll stick to that, but 
Needless to say, um, yeah. ivermectin is um, as as Alex Jones said on um, Andrew Schultz's Flagrant Two the other day. Ivermectin is white supremacy, and anyone that said otherwise is um, <laughs> is just a racist and uh, sexist. And so, anyone that's listening to this, ivermectin is white supremacy. Um, that should cover us. Yes, do uh, not do not <laughs> search ivermectin. Do not buy it. It is. Uh, yeah. Mm -mm -mm. it's a bad idea um all of the doctors who are because i don't think the youtube algorithm picks up sarcasm so all of the doctors who are pushing it um ha, are pushing a drug from which they don't stand to benefit at all are clearly being paid off by the people who don't own the copyright or the patent for it it's all total misinformation and brett weinstein is definitely unqualified to talk about anything um <laughs> No, so, yeah, and, and, that should and, cover and heaven forbid you use a, a, a substance that's designed for animals. I mean, what are, are we animals? What is mm -hmm. this animal animal farm? Come mm -hmm. on, no, no, it's <laughs> I have no idea. Like, the next thing it'll be uh, some some people are more equal than others. Oh my god, uh, <laughs> are you kidding me? Yeah. Um, so you you and you're in the questions that you uh, emailed me before the show. You said, "Are we in some form of cold information war?" Mm. And uh, I think so. I mean, I think, I mean, look at China. I mean, look at, um, you know, I think we've evolved. I mean, at this point, it, it's not really practical to go to war with tanks and airplanes and bombs, right? So I think mm -hmm. it's more effective to just control the the flow of information. If you can control the flow of information, you can brainwash people. You can help, you know, maybe not brainwash. That's kind of strong, but you, you can influence their, their perceptions, their attitudes. So you look at, you know, our attitude toward China versus other countries. Or if you, you go to South America, what, what do South Americans think about Americans? Some of them lo love us, some of them hate us. Um, so yeah, definitely cold information war. I mean, any dictator, or, or if you look in the past of like, you know, uh, Middle Ages, you look at these feudal lords, they controlled, you know, you had your, your serfs and your peasants and they just did what they were told. They had to stay under the protection of their, their feudal lord. So I think the masses are just are, are being controlled. It is definitely cold information war. But yeah, these, any any tyrant in the past two thousand years would would have loved to use Facebook as a as a tool to you know change the perceptions of of their their constituents. Mm. And yeah, and the the fact that I love that every time um, something happens, say um, like the the January sixth riots insurrection mm -hmm. freedom freedom march whatever you want to call it <laughs> um, uh, yeah. the every time something like that happens the fingers are pointed at and i watch it happen every single time it's like oh misinformation and and these things are happening on uh whatsapp or telegram or parlor or any mm -hmm. of these platforms and yeah. it's like facebook is just <clears throat> the worst for this and yet Facebook is just like escapes blame most of the time on this, yeah. aside from on like some other things. I mean, I had um, another whistleblower from Facebook on my show a little while back, um, Sophie Zhang, who who was who was uh, let go, she believed. Yeah, because yeah I read she her story. Kept, she, she believed she was let go because she kept pushing um, for more investigation, more power to be able to stop um inauthentic content and activity being posted and uh, the the problem is as well and i don't know maybe this like push for people to not be anonymous on social media will kind of backfire a little mm -hmm. way in a little, a little way because often what i see is uh, i'm unsure now whenever i see anyone with like a really generic like handle especially on twitter i'm like yeah how many of these people are real and it's not because I'm like, oh, no one could possibly think that. It's just because uh, the, I'm aware that there's so much inauthentic, like bot or or scripted activity going on. Um, uh, uh, and the, the the primary example that we've just seen is was was what happened in Cuba. Um, mm -hmm. There was there was like as soon as it happened, there was bots everywhere talking about it, and on on both yep. sides as well. Um, like, how much do you think that the bots like what portion of of the comments about anything these days actually on social media would you guess are either scripted bots or shills that are being paid to post yeah um you know it's interesting when we had uh when i reviewed content at facebook and 
and I, I reviewed groups and pages uh, and, and videos for Instagram and Facebook, but we, we would get these reports in. So we would see who reported the comment. And it's funny because we would get all these reports in like one after another, where it was just like this, you know, just like your typical, just like Asian person, just like very, like kind of like, uh, what's the word? Um, when you have like a stock photo, like a stock photo of an Asian person, and it was re like reported by that person. And like, they didn't have that many profile photos. And we're like, huh, maybe that's like, a Facebook's bot, like their AI bot that goes in and reports stuff. Um, so yeah, yeah, I, I don't know exactly. That's probably Sophie Zhang's expertise. She was a data scientist for Facebook, and um, and I yeah, I read her account. It's just very, but I will say, yeah, I, I mean, in certain countries, like in South America, I would say easily there could be like you know thirty percent, thirty percent of the content could be bots, especially during election season. So I was there monitoring the the twenty eighteen Mexican presidential election. And then I saw a lot of content from Peru, from Venezuela. Um, you know, there's a lot of hate speech from Peruvians against Venezuelans because Venezuelans were moving there uh, with nothing, and they were a lot of them. A lot of them turned out to be petty criminals. Um, some of them did. Um, so, so yeah, during election season, and we saw this in Colombia recently. About a month ago, there was a bunch of protests in Colombia against the current president, and and all that. A lot of that was censored by Facebook. So it's, it's really bad when, when you see how Facebook is being used to suppress things. You now, what's funny is Facebook actually gave an exception to allow the phrase death to Khamenei in Iran. So, of course, like so normally that phrase is not allowed, death to any president. But for like three months, Facebook said, we're going to allow that phrase in Iran. So it's like they can just like flip a switch and like turn on political dissent, just, just, you know, turn it off. And so that's, that's I think, insane. They have that much power. But I mean, it goes back to 2011, to the Arab Spring. I mean, that's what set off the whole Arab Spring was this guy who was self-emulating and burning himself. He went viral. So I mean, yeah, the the world has realized in the last 11, 10 years how powerful social media can be for color revolutions. And so Facebook can just flip a switch. Yeah, we'll, we'll allow this. We'll we'll allow, that, we'll allow that speech in Iran. We'll allow death to Khamenei, mm. or we we won't. Or we won't allow any pro, you know protests in Cuba to get out. So, um, you know, if there is some like you know evil global scheme, well, th they would sure like Facebook. Facebook would be the per perfect partner to like quash rebellions or revolutions. Mm. And Khamenei is the is this the he's the the dictator was he is he the, the yeah he's like Iran? the Ayatollah okay. I think yeah. Okay. Um, but it's 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 horrifying that. It's not, it's like, for me, the problem is not even that there's, um, you know, something maybe that people say that you can't say, you know, or you, you shouldn't be allowed to say, because, you know, I, 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 there's probably some, some things that maybe like you shouldn't be allowed to say online. Like if you're saying, oh, hey, I got this miracle cure for X or, or, you know, mm -hmm. here's these weight loss pills and like, there's things like that you should, you should probably like if you're saying it and it's blatantly false and you're selling something to people that you should probably be like be able to be sued or removed or something for for those sorts of things but but when you're just expressing an opinion about about something um yeah whether that is um if vaccine passports are tyranny or not or whether you believe that uh i can't i can't even think of great examples right now but but this shouldn't be like a partisan issue yeah um this like for me it's been horrifying over the last year like some like i'm pretty left wing on a lot of things but it's been horrifying to watch especially the left and the center as well just sort of collapse on mm -hmm. on 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 the freedom of speech like i've no idea what happened because i don't know i, I was under this like weird world where we all kind of agreed that freedom of speech was really important yeah um I, I, the the founding fathers, like whether or not you agree that the American system is still great, um, I, the, the, those guys wrote a like wrote a a small document that managed to create a country that has become the richest, most prosperous in the history of the world, and the, the basically is governed in broadly the same way under the same system as was created two hundred and fifty years ago. Yeah, and like these these guys were clearly smart people and they put not not down at the bottom not like 15 not like number six like number one freedom of speech why do you think we've forgotten how important that is and why do you think people think the online world is different in that 
Yeah, uh, you know, there's a, a, a recent movie called uh, Ready Player One, and in it, in the future, we all live in this, we all live in like shacks, <laughs> like big trailer parks, and we all live in a virtual world. So we try to strap on our headset and we can go anywhere, be anywhere, be anyone, and um, play our video games or whatever. So we're so detached from reality. And I think, you know, with the advent of Netflix and the, and the internet, we're just, we're more and more isolated. So we're in our homes, we're, we're, we're fat, we're happy, right? We watch our football game or our soccer game. And so I think that's what's made this possible is, you know, people are, are just so more easily manipulated by, by the media. So if, if I say, you know, oh, that, that's horrible, I, those, those people are racist. Or a perfect example is like Ben Shapiro going to, I think, at UC Berkeley to give a speech. And he's not able to give a speech because the Antifa people show up and, you know, throw riots, you know, break things throw a fit, throw a tantrum. And so because of that, he's not able to speak. So it's like, okay, this guy's so racist. We shouldn't let him, let him speak. We need to shut it down. So they are becoming what they hate because they're de- not allowing freedom of speech. Um, if, he's, if he's truly racist and he's speaking, then okay, then, then educate people that racism is bad and, and he won't be popular. Like nobody will come and listen to his speech. Mm. So the, the answer to bad speech is always more speech. Um, and it's it's really subjective too. So it, I mean, it just depends on wh- what the current attitudes is are. And the perfect example is like okay, West. I give I think I gave this example before. Westboro Baptist Church. So should people be should be able should people be able to protest outside of a funeral attacking someone because of their sexual identity? What mm. now? Someone's standing on a public street, saying you you know saying using uh, really horrible words to describe uh, someone's sexuality. But should, we, should that be banned? Okay, you're going to ban someone from a public street. And that's the issue now with the internet is we don't really have a definition for what the internet is. Is it public area? Is it is it quasi-public? Is it the public square? Mm. Oh, well, they're, oh, they're private companies. They can do whatever they want. But if everyone's on Facebook, then it's no longer like a private area. It's a public area. So those, those are some of the issues with the, the current debate. But um, yeah, it's become really easy to just immediately jump to conclusions and people have really lost their ability to critically think. And that's reason, the reason why our freedom of speech is being threatened. Mm. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 it's really, really, really scary. And I, I, I don't know what we do about it. That's the most terrifying thing. Yeah. It's because like normally what I would say, like I, because I, I no longer believe you can trust the government to to regulate these these companies because it has been become so inherently corrupt right. that it. But at the same time, these companies are becoming more and more powerful, and their ability to sort of police what people say is as the world becomes more and more digital, it becomes more and more concerning because they have control over a, like a growing portion of our lives especially with the lockdowns and whatnot mm-hmm. um and uh, the scary thing for me is like how do we fight back and like talk about this because obviously right right now yeah. thankfully um they I, i'm still on youtube thankfully yeah um and um they haven't yet come for podcasts because they have no way to like troll the RSS feeds of audio <laughs> things that are sometimes hours and hours long. They, they just don't have the tech, but like if, as long as humanity doesn't re-enter some sort of dark age, like the technology will eventually get there. And I'm sorry if everyone, everyone can hear the thunder going on outside. It's gone from like 32 degrees and sunshine to like just pure <laughs> thunderstorm. So I, I can't do anything about it. Um, although it is a little cooler, so I'm pretty happy. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, like, what do you think we do about this when when our yeah. way to get the word out is the <laughs> same place that is constricting our speech? And you know, I think we should have competitive, you know, competitor social media platforms, and that was the whole idea of the internet. So the internet could be this this uh, place that's free from government regulations. Like that was the whole idea behind the internet. So, I mean. Yeah, it, it is a possibility we could have something like regulatory commission, kind of like the FCC, make make a make a social media kind of like a uh, public utility. So I think that might be a step in the right direction. But 
yeah, it's there's there's so many ways it could be abused. I mean, President Biden just told us a couple of weeks ago that he's going to be scanning through our text messages to prevent, you know, I don't know, hate speech or whatever misinformation. And so that that's bogus. But, you know, I just watched the, this movie the other day from like 2004 with uh, uh, Will Smith called I, Robot. Oh, and man, I, I watched Ro- that the other day. Yeah, 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 right. <laughs> so in I, Rob, Robot, I mean, you have this AI that thinks it's better than humanity, that thinks it's no, it knows what's best for humanity. And that's why I f- kind of feel like it's happening is like you know, the powers that be, it could be AI or it could be some evil global scheme. I don't know. They're, they're saying, hey, we know what's best for humanity. Take the, you know, take your vaccine, take your whatever, you know, you can say this, you can't say that. Hmm. So it's kind of this control that's being forced upon us. And in the movie, you, you know, the AI takes over and he has all his robots, you know, hurting people up, telling them they have to go to their home, stay in your home, stay in your home. Yeah, yeah. And the people go out in the streets and try to fight back. You know, so I feel like we're at that moment. We're trying to like fight back, but like not so much on a physical level, but like on a uh, on the internet, we're trying to fight back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there's that moment actually. Like I watched this fairly recently, and it's yeah. just like Zoe Zuckerberg. Um, <laughs> um, but I, I, and then there's that that bit where like the 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 robots are trying to get the people to go back into the curfew in in curfew is like return to your homes this is for your own protection and i was just being like oh my dear god what like (laughs) and then yeah yeah. there's another movie called uh abigail you should watch it it's called called abigail and it's on i think it's on amazon prime speaking of tech overlords um (laughs) abigail and and in it there's um in this imagine this like it's like a uh, what's it called? What's that called? The um, do, 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 do. that style of dress where it's like old but new, retro, <laughs> retro, something like that. But anyway, it's in this this village that people have magical powers, and then they're told that the magical powers are evil, and they test everyone for the powers, and they say it's a it's a it's a sickness, but it's actually these people that have magical powers. Um, but anyways, um, yeah, we're in this fight right now against tyranny. So I think supporting alternate social media sites, blockchain, you know, places like pocketnet.app is a social media site I use. And then, you know, Gab, obviously. So creating this alternate version of, of uh, the, the same products is important because uh, there's this clash of cultures right now and they're trying to just become the dominant culture. But we need to be able to, to voice our opinion and, and fight back online and, and in person. Mm. I mean, for me, it's it's, I'm not even sure that that's, going to be something good because i feel like we have to fight to make the platforms that have become the big ones either smaller or better Mm -hmm. and this is this is what like steven crowder is attempting to do because i know he's also suing facebook he's suing youtube and google um and uh, it's almost like a public accommodation it's like public use like if i'm using the public bus it has to be accessible to everybody i can't just say oh i don't like the color of your hat you can't get on the public bus right mm. so that that's another legal argument but yes yeah, steven crowder and and them yeah it's some, something has to be done to kind of wrest that power remove that power from them because they're mm. just way yeah they're they're way too big yeah uh yeah because yeah the, the problem is that the like and i remember this being an issue that that, that like especially left wingers were really concerned about uh five six years ago i read minimum five books on 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 the topic of like how social media was dividing us and it was creating echo chambers and filter bubbles and stuff and like i dedicated like a whole chapter to this in my first book Mm -hmm. and um i'm scared that if we get if we end up in a position where there are like there's like mainstream social media and then there's the other ones or there's not even mainstream, like there's left wing social media and then there's right wing social media Yeah. or there's like pro authoritarian social media or like pro freedom social media. And and that if we don't have like a common grind, because I don't know, I feel like social media in a way had actually done a great thing in, in replacing the kind of like water cooler zeitgeist that Mm -hmm. that, that we sort of lost for a while there as as everything became more fractured and decentralized on the internet like there wasn't so much of a common culture and what social Mm -hmm. media actually managed to do very temporarily i think was was provide things that everyone saw because Mm -hmm. it got widely shared and and that like 
there was like clashes of ideas and facts and yeah. ultimately in theory the best and like the the truth should have risen to the top and like twitter even talked about this in 2016 i think it was mm -hmm. they like people came out and said oh hey you need to remove trump's misinformation or thing and like twitter came out and said we believe that the real-time nature of our platform provides users the ability to correct in real-time misinformation and that is the best way to combat like false information wow and then they, they yeah they actually came out and said that um uh, that they were they were like touting the real-time corrective nature of the community as a bonus and, a, and a, as a feature yeah. and a way in which like the best ideas would rise to the top because like, apparently mm -hmm. jack dorsey hadn't been you know taken aside and i don't know what the fuck they did to him um, <laughs> replaced you him, wonder yeah yeah replaced him with a clone or neutered <laughs> him or i, I don't know <laughs> Yeah. Like they, they, they've perfected Neuralink and he's already, you know, gone or I, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah. but like there, there yeah. was, yeah. No. And so do you write about that in your, tell me about your, you, do you write about that, the, those issues in your new book as well? Uh, and tell me about your book. Oh yeah. So like the new one is about, is about GameStop. Um, mm. So yeah, if anyone's listening and hasn't heard about this, where have you been? Um, but, but like the, I've, I've heard that there's several mainstream journalists writing about the story and a book about the story. And I'm determined to get out before them because they are all reportedly from what I've heard, focusing on what happened in January. So, um, mm -hmm. anyone that's not listening, um, a bunch of hedge funds, um, made a bet that GameStop specifically was going to crash because uh, COVID and, you know, no one buys games in store anymore and the company was failing. And like all of these things were blatantly untrue, um, mm -hmm. but they bet that this was going to happen. And what happens when they make that bet, it makes it more likely to happen. So they made like, like millions and millions and millions and millions of these bets. And then a whole bunch of people on Reddit spotted what happened and they were like, hang on, if we buy the stock, we can we can screw them over and um, temporarily the price spiked to four hundred and eighty dollars and then mm -hmm. a whole bunch of trading platforms just like halted trading and the the price went through the floor again and then it's been mm -hmm. sort of slowly like going up and then bashing down and then up and bashed down but <laughs> the community that's formed around it is fucking incredible and it sort of plays into what i was just talking about yeah it's um they are <clears throat> teaching each other about this super complex like financial jargon um about like the the inner workings of the stock market they're educating yeah. each other on like the background of the hedge funds that are being uh, that are involved and and yeah. all the while there's there's reports and i think pretty credible evidence that the the subreddits are being infiltrated and the community mm -hmm. has like ducked and weaved and tried to like weed out people who are not authentic members of mm -hmm. the community and it's been this like incredible information war and that is what i'm writing about compared to yeah. just um a, like people saying oh you know the poor people almost you know did a stock market um mm -hmm. in january but like what's been happening since um is just stunning to me and it's yeah. proof that people can provide education fact checking and like honest real-time correction of things because there's been uh, numerous occasions where something false or incorrect has been posted on the community like upvoted to the top or liked and shared mm -hmm. widely and then someone will come in and go hang on that's not right here's what really happened and everyone reads that accepts it corrects the like community hive mind knowledge and moves forward with it and yeah. like it's proof that we can do this you know yeah no that's great that you're writing a book uh yeah i, I, I applaud you for that i hope you, you crowdfund enough for that and i think it's fascinating i think yeah you know wall street's a perfect example of of you know things that can be are wrong in society and things we can improve and there's a show called and we'll probably wrap it up here in a, in a, in a minute here but there's a show called Billions on Showtime, I think. I've been watching this TV show called Billions with mm. Damian Lewis. And, uh, you know, you got the Wall Street broker who's making billions off of, like, inside trading. And then the, the feds are after him. So, um, mm. but, yeah, let, let me uh, – just to wrap up, um, yeah, thanks for having me on, Josh. Um, I hope things are okay in London. But sounds like you're telling me before the show things are, things are kind of rough. They're trying to ramp through that pass, vaccine passport. Mm. So you're more than welcome to, you know, come to <laughs> – Come to the U.S. Uh, if you, if you can, if possible. But um, hmm. yeah, I'm any final, final thoughts or final question for me? Um, should we break up Facebook? 
Yes. Uh, yes, we need to break it up. I, I think at this point it's going to be too impossible. Like even if you were to reform or write new legislation, Facebook has been hiring a lot more lobbyists, so they would be able to have the advantage if, if that legislation is written. So yeah, in, in my in my perfect world, they could they could just be broken up, split into like three different companies, at least divest Instagram from them at the very least. That would be a good start. That. But uh, but yeah, that's yeah. We should break them up, break them up as much as possible, and stop them from being tyrants. Yeah, yeah, couldn't agree more. So uh, Ryan, thank you very much. Everybody, go check out his book, Behind the Mask of Facebook. If you enjoyed what I was saying about my book, you can check out the crowdfunder in the link uh, in the description below. Um, I'll also link your book and uh, your Twitter and everything. And uh, yeah, man, thanks very much. It's been a been a great chat as usual. Yeah, thanks, Josh. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of the podcast. Don't forget our sponsor, ExpressVPN, and my book, Brexit, The Establishment Civil War, can both be found in the links in the description below. And also, please like, share, and subscribe to this podcast. It's the best way to help us grow. Until next time, thanks for listening. The animal dragged a child around its enclosure. The child had fallen into that enclosure. Officials are now defending their actions. ABC's Alex. A few things I am not. I am not a cat. I am not an institutional investor. Nor am I a hedge fund. There's no panic selling. These people, you know, they may have bought at $4, sat through $400, went back to $40, went to $350, back down to $110, and they have not sold. All they've done is bought more. And there's no answer for that. There's no, they, they, you know, it, it is like art of war mastery by a bunch of idiots who should know better. And they're just, they're just like, I'm not fucking leaving. Fly me to the moon. Let me play among the stars. Let me see what spring is like on Jupiter and Mars. What's been happening on Reddit and in social media and in the marketplace has never been seen before. Uh, the short 70, 60, 80 percent of a company, let alone 140 percent, I think a lot of people universally believe something is wrong there. They're powerful. They want a stock hire. It's child's play. Why ever sell into the maw of Wall Street? Yeah, Reddit bets. Why? 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 But everyone's wrong. It's like the big short again. Or more like the big short squeeze this time, right? So here we got the fox guarding the hen house. And one of the hens is complaining. The fox is out to kill us. And the farmer says, I'm sorry, the fox is in charge of the hen house. Whenever there is not billions, but like trillions of dollars involved in something, it I, I argue that nothing is off the table. The way they have absolutely cheated, stolen, robbed everyday people so all our hedge fund billionaire friends can get out and not get killed is one of the most remarkable, illegal, shocking robberies in the history in plain sight. Super Stonk and the other communities that have emerged are a hive mind, the likes of which we have never seen before. It's madness and brilliance, insanity and genius all rolled into one. It's very possible that Citadel will be gone in a few months. And, and not just Citadel, but the entire financial system has the potential to come crashing down. These crooks continue to gamble recklessly with the world economy and this could be the moment that they finally get their justice. You got maybe 10 million people doing this who now own you know probably more than 100 million shares and eventually you know they might own everything